There's a book by Somerset Maugham called The Moon and Sixpence. It's vaguely the story of Gauguin's life. And in there, there's a quote. <clears throat> there is an innate faculty for myth in the human race. There's the protest of romance against the commonplace of life. Well, we're all a little bit in love with fairy tales. We all love stories. And in every village square, in every country in the entire world, you'll always find eventually a great big monument to some hero. Usually they're not a hero at all. They're usually somebody who's made a whole bunch of money out of grinding the faces of the working classes. And then, in their twilight years, as they feel the cold rot of mortality enter their bones, they toss a few shekels back to the proletariat, to the arts, to the, to the disenfranchised. And then in return, the grateful populace put up a great big hunk of bronze to them. And it's usually a lie. But it ain't necessarily so. I mean, the more I researched into Graham, the more I came to like him. He seemed to be a man without flaws. It's improbable, but it's possible. And everybody I met along the way said how ready he was to help. Uh, okay, so he, he was an extraordinary athlete. He did some extraordinary things. At the age of five, he contracted polio. He had very little use of his legs. And then one day, he was introduced to sport. He said, in his own words, it was like a door opening for me. And suddenly, he had somewhere to channel his energy. And this extraordinary man went on to make such extraordinary success out of such extraordinary adversity. Uh, uh, it must have been 1967, my first year at high school, and we were doing a walk coming in from the country into town. It was the, the star something or other. started off at a store somewhere. I, I was thinking it was Springston yeah. or Springfield. He gave us a nice ride into town, or gave us part, a ride part of the way, and we, we could have actually won, won the walk if we had wanted to. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was my introduction to Graham Condon. And, uh, Why did he stop? How did he know you? Oh, I think one of the boys had waved him down. Oh, so okay. yeah, look, there's Graham or whatever, and yeah. yeah, I think it must have been at least half a dozen of us piled into his car, and he gave us a head start. So was he quite well known? I, I don't think so, but uh, he must have been a good Papua Nui boy, um, because virtually everybody that was walking with me that was a Pap High knew him. And, uh, How's that kid? He drove it well. <laughs> <coughs> I'm only assuming that he had made the, um, the modification to the vehicle himself, because I've never seen anything like it before. Yeah. I was really impressed. That was the reason I was. So you had the accelerator. Yeah, it was work? like a twist grip and and something a lever to work the clutch and. Right. Yeah, and I was quite mechanically minded at the time, so. Um, yeah, it was really intriguing, and plus he was a nice guy too. So. Yeah. Sad to see him go that way. Eh? Now I think, well, well, where do you hook into this? Where do you find, what is it? Where, where do you find somewhere to begin in the sculpture? Well, what's the idea? What's the idea? Well, how are we going to capture this man? What's, what's this one idea? Now in every sculpture, the way I see it is this. There's three elements. There's, there's form, context, and there's a story. Now with the context, the Graham Condon sculpture is going to go outside the recreation centre, fair enough. The context sorts itself out there. It was, it was his home, if you like. Form? Well, that's up to every artist to try and find that. To be able to walk around, around the sculpture 360 degrees and find that every degree works. It's very, very difficult. Usually we miss. We try, but we miss. Um, and this one? Yeah, there's a couple of angles I really, really love. The, the rest of them, well, they're kind of compromises, but that's my inadequacy, if you like. The story part, that's the thing. And the one that we struck on was one that perhaps he could tell you better in his own words. There is a marathon in the uh, 84 Paralympics. We were travelling in a pack and Bobby McIntyre, who's an Australian chap, was behind me and there was eight of us in a row. And uh, the Canadian balked in front and he was meant to say that it was a pothole, but he didn't. And I threw my chair up and Bobby ended up going straight out the back. So for some reason I just stopped and I went back and grabbed the front of his chair and pulled him back into it and we caught up the pack. And Bobby actually got the bronze. Oh, I got the bronze, and Bobby got the silver. And he bit me. And uh, but to this day, I can go anywhere in Australia. And everyone knows. 
So there we have it. That's the moment when he's reaching down to help his, his companion, his competitor, to help him. And the way he reached out to so many people on the plaque, on the sculpture, it says, he reached his hand down to anybody who cared to take it. So there you go. Um, what do you do? Well, you get a bit of paper. You find a bit of paper, an old envelope in this case, and start sketching down the first preliminary ideas, just the ideas of, of how this could work. One thing I wanted to do here, I, I don't know if, it's, if I was writing this or not, but I didn't want to put the wheelchair into the sculpture because, well, the minute I did that, he would be compartmentalized the same way as when I tell people that I'm an artist. They say, oh, you're an artist, you're one of those. So you're probably a tree hugger as well. They put me into a box and say, well, that's the box of art. and We don't go there. So to have Graham confined to the wheelchair would put him into a box. And you see, he didn't do that. He didn't stay with, with disabled. He, he trained with able-bodied athletes. He, he, his life was full of people who weren't disabled. He wasn't in a box at all. But that's what that wheelchair would have done, would have framed him off. So instead, I've got a plinth. I've got him rising out of the plinth almost sort of half sculpted, which in fact is really the reality of it. And halfway through his life, it was cut off. There's much more of him to go, but, but in this way, you've got the man, you've got him with his healthy, robust body of, let's say, a man of mid-30s, but the face is a little bit older. It's the face that the public knew. It's the face of the, of the councillor. It was his press face, if you like. It was the face that was easily recognised. He had many faces in his life. And that's one of the problems of the sculpture. When, I, when I've gone back through all the photographs, I've seen so many grand condoms, different shapes, different sizes, beard, no beard, and so forth. And what we need for this is the public face, the face that the people remember, not simply his family. And of course, there are no photographs of him on the 360 degrees axis, which, which a sculptor really needs to work from. So I, 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 I have to just take a, take a take a shot at the, at, at, at the likeness and hope for the best. Right. So we start with the sketches, fine. And then with the sketches, I sort of got the idea sort of worked out on paper. Then I get a piece of clay, I dig the clay up out of the ground here. So it's rough clay, it's old swamp clay. It's, it's not great, but it, it does the job. Then having made a small sculpture out of the clay, then I'll refine it, make it out of plaster. And with the plaster, with the white plaster, I can see the shadows and the divots. I can see all the, the details that I can't see in dull clay. It's a plaster I, I really like. And from that small plaster model, having got the gestures right, then I work up into a half-size piece of plaster, which, which I can sort of solve most of the problems on. Once I've got those problems solved on the half-size form of Graham, then I cut that into pieces, put it onto a pantograph, which is going to expand the thing into a twice life-size model. It's, it's the same thing as using calipers, only it's a little bit quicker. And then on the life-size model, then that's when the final sculpting comes into play, and that's probably the most difficult part. Now after the sculpting into the plaster, uh, once I'm happy with that, we take molds of the surface of that plaster and in this case we took about 30, 25 to 30 molds of the surface of that plaster. We took it in substance which wasn't plaster of Paris, it is made of plaster of Paris and crushed brick, a very traditional form of bronze casting. This is a refractory material, it can stand a lot of heat. And that material, we, we put it on about say two, three, three inches thick. We take off a beautiful print off the critical surface of the plaster. And then onto that surface, I'll layer five millimeters of clay, a thin layer of clay, however thick I want the bronze to be, and then make a sandwich. I'll, I'll make another sloppy mix of Ludo, place it on the back of that first face. Uh, so we've got a sandwich now with clay in between. Once the Ludo is set uh, into a very firm substance, I take it apart, remove the clay, put it back together again. Now you've got a hollow mold. Now that mold can have bronze poured into it, but not until the mold has been superheated to drive all the water out of the mold. Not just the water, not just the dampness, but the chemically bonded water in, in that, in that uh, refractory material. If you don't, and the bronze gets in there and steam arrives, you've got a disaster. <laughs> We've had a few of those, but that's okay. It's just part of the bronze casting process. Don't tell off. So having, having dried out those molds 
and preparing it for the, for the bronze to go into the mould, we take them very carefully out of the furnace. They're now as delicate as a ginger biscuit, even delicate, more delicate. And then we put them into a pit and we pack dirt around those moulds to hold them firm. The bronze going in is going to try and push them apart. We don't want that to happen, of course. So very carefully we pack the dirt around those, those, those moulds. We might have three or four moulds in the pit. And then we'll, we'll melt up a, a pot full of bronze, I don't know, maybe 80 kilograms of bronze. And in between us, we'll, we'll skim it and we'll pour it into the moulds. Hopefully everything goes well, there's no hissing, no steam comes out. You can, you can actually hear it, you can hear when the metal's running beautifully through the moulds. The, mold be, the metal pours down into the mould by way of a pourer, and we'll show you this later, and then drives, drives all the gases out, vents in the sides, because you don't want gas trapped in the moulds, you don't want little bubbles in the fingertips or in the chin or the nose or the ears, you want, you want those to be clear. So for every, for, for every pointy surface, uh, we try to lead the gases away from them, so that the, the bronze metal can flow through and out again without but being impeded. And we get a good print. Then we'll leave those, uh, that metal, those moulds on the ground for maybe a quarter of an hour just to cool down. It doesn't have to be much longer. A cup of tea's worth. Then we'll dig them up, break them open, and hopefully the bronze is all there. It's pretty rough stuff. We have to then get angle grinders and cut off the sprues and the risers and clean them up a wee bit. And then if you've got, say with Graham, those 29 pieces, we'll then weld them all together with a MIG welder. Each plate will go together, be welded into, into a, uh, a form which makes it all one solid piece. And then once that's in place and everything looks right, the proportions are correct, then we'll work over it with files and fettling tools, take away all the rough edges. And the final thing I do is just rub my hand over the whole form to find any kind of catches, any nicks, any tiny, tiny bubbles of metal. Once we've got the great uh, piece of bronze in place, on a pedestal, up high, away from the ground, away from us, we'll spray it with acids to get um, whatever patinas we want. Usually ours is a blue-black patina. This time I used a mixture of blue, brown, and a bit of black, just to get a gradation. I wanted it to go sort of dark from the waist up to a sort of light brown at the top, mainly because Graham's face was looking down and would be in shadow, and it would be hard to see if it was all black. So with that light brown look, you can see him quite clearly. Plus it's a nice uh, development from the black plinth flowing through into the light brown. It's a nice effect. So that's really all there is to it. The final touch, I suppose, is to coat the thing with beeswax and give it a good polishing, and then we set. The only thing then to do is to check on it from time to time to make sure the patina isn't creeping in some way. That, that's easily fixed. A little bit of heat, a little bit more wax, and it'll do it. Now, whenever I tell this process to art groups who come here, after about two minutes, their faces go blank. What on earth is he talking about? So in this video, I'm going to show you just some of the preparatory pieces. For example, uh, I'll just show you a quick diagram of how, of how, say, a typical lost wax process uh, mold works. And take a look at this. So there you are. That's really everything I can tell you about the processes behind this project. The nice part, of course, is next time you're at a party and somebody comes up to you and says, do you know how to cast a bronze sculpture? Well, you'll be able to say, well, I've got half an idea. 
I've got to go now. I'm supposed to be playing Federer on the next piece of music. So, um, so good luck. Thank you.